so Seward uh, Co-op is the co-op that I am the general manager for. Uh, we're located in, in Minneapolis. Uh, we've had a very uh, uh, dramatic growth uh, narrative. Uh, I first started working at the co-op 23 years ago uh, when it was a 1.2 million, 1,200 uh, square foot store. So I can see the vantage point of many sizes. 11 years ago, I came on as the GM. Um, and uh, we were doing about 6 million in sales, had about 70 employees. And by uh, 2008, we were doing 12 million. And uh, the fiscal year that we're in right now, uh, we'll be hitting 34 million in sales. Uh, the store itself, in terms of size, is about 13,000 square feet. Uh, we're at 20, uh, 240 employees. Uh, we have 13,000 owners. And right now, we have two projects under construction for a total of uh, $15 million of, of projects under construction. To do that, we had to uh, raise quite a bit of capital. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about raising that capital and how that is uh, a really uh, an important part of uh, our competitive advantage when we have a, a community of support behind the operations that we have. And one of the key questions I think is there is how did we so quickly get to redevelopment after building such a, a large project? So when we did the project uh, several years ago, it was about a ten and a half million dollar project as well. So we went from, you know, uh, uh, a lot of new development in a very short period of time. Um, so f it's always important to start with the ends, you know. So at Seward Co-op, you know, we're about sustaining a healthy community with equitable economic uh, relationships, positive environmental impacts, and inclusive socially responsible practices. Not not a whole lot about groceries in there, even though we're <clears throat> very much in the industry of groceries. Um, so you know, we built the store on down the street on Franklin, had that really incredible successful uh, launch. And within a couple of years, you know, the, we accomplished what the market study said we'd do in five years. And the board started asking, well, at what point is this going to be uh, too small of a store to meet the needs of people coming to the co-op to get their needs met? And I kind of casually wrote, looked down the street at the wedge and said, 30 million. You know, the wedge is doing 30 million. You know, I think 30 million is the point where we really, really need to have a project under construction. And, and our growth continued to be very dynamic. And... Uh, you know, we really started to ask questions about, you know, how do we realize these ends? How do we operationalize them and, 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 and realize the kind of uh, dynamic that we want to have that's articulated in this ends? Um, and so we, we came up with a, a, a long-term vision and a strategy to accomplish that. And at the you know, heart of our long-term vision is this idea around creating commonwealth. You know, that's a, a word that's, for some people, it means a state. You know, why are you talking about creating a state? You know, there's a lot of questions with this, this word. But if you actually start to dig deeper into the meaning of the word and kind of cycle back to its origin, the origin of the word meant the well-being of others, the well-being of all, the common good. And, but it also had an economic activity built behind that. You know? And as you start to think about what we're accomplishing as a cooperative, it, it seemed to me to be the, the right word. Originally, when we wrote this, we actually had another one, which was called uh, a cooperative zone. You know, I went to Montregon and learned about the Montregon cooperative system. And they have a, a zone of cooperation there that's pretty significant in their economy. And so that was kind of like the touchstone of where that went. But, you know, this word actually captures it better. But there's a few other things that how are we going to accomplish that? You know, what business strategies, as the leader of the co-op, the general manager, what business strategies are we going to take to get there? You know, so one of the things is that, you know, we want to sell sustainably made product. And we actually want to make it. You know, we want to make those products, those products uh, that don't exist necessarily in the marketplace. We want to um, create what are called sometimes third places, or we call it gathering spaces here, because we think that you know, if we're going to sustain a healthy community, we have to have a space for people to gather. You know, community over food needs a common space. Uh, and then finally, if we were to take our thinking and go out 10, 15, 20 years, you know, what does that look like? And our goal is to uh, try to create more access in the market 
create more opportunities for people to shop at co-ops. And when we got to that point, we actually kind of went back up to the top, which is that we'll actually partner with other people to accomplish these things. Um, and so that's really what we've worked towards, is that we'll, we'll work with other co-ops. We'll also then take the efforts necessary to realize some of these projects ourselves. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Commonwealth and what does that actually mean in a real sense. So let's just kind of walk through if we're going to develop, you know, if we're going to be a competitive player in the marketplace, we need to bring to forth, you know, to the market more structure. We need to have more options for people to shop. And so let's kind of kind of go through the logic of all that, you know. So, you know, to build greater capacity, we need more assets. We need more structure to do that. So, you know, to uh, either build new assets or to maintain the assets that we have, we need to have money. So where does the money come from? You know, there, there's three places I tell people. I used to be a lender for the co-ops as, as, as well before when I worked at North Country Co-op Development Fund. There are three places that money comes from. One is you uh, borrow it, you earn it, or you steal it. Those are the three places where money actually, if you want to, if you want to bring money in. Obviously, we're not going to do the last one. And so we have to borrow or earn it. And then the earning is really about how do we bring our community into this. That's where I'm kind of going with all this. And so we need to find ways to build owner equity in the business. You know, because we're, we're not going to just be able to borrow our way into the future. We also have to invest in our own future. So I have up here <clears throat> sort of the sewer debt to equity story. So debt to equity is how you, uh, banks or other uh, boards, you look at this as how we got what we own. So uh, you have assets in either borrowed money or you earned or built it amongst yourselves, the, the, amongst the co-op. And so for every dollar of debt, there's how many dollars of equity. And so you look at the history though over time 2004, 2009 is when we moved down the street. 2014 is the end of last fiscal year. And then December 14 of 2014 is after we financed all these, you know, $15 million of projects under construction. And what's really different you see here is, you know, after we built, you know, before we let up into the, the, the relocation, our, our debt to equity number was not that great. You know, a good debt to equity number is between two and three and a half to one. You know, two at, when you get to two to one debt to equity, you're maybe not leveraged as well as you could be if you're thinking from a lender's perspective. When you get to three and a half, there start to be questions about are you over leveraged? And so if you look at these numbers, um, you'll see that, uh, you know, we borrowed 11 million. That shot our, our debt to equity ratio almost to seven to one, meaning seven dollars of debt for every dollar of equity. And from a banker's perspective, that's kind of risky. But then you look at December, of 2014, after we ra you know, raised 15 million. By the way, uh, 3.1 million of that came from owners investing in the co-op. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. But you look at this and you see that uh, uh, we, after all this, we did three to one. We're still actually in a position where we could probably borrow more money based on what bankers perceive as being reasonable debt to equity. One thing that's also a really important adjustment that we all need to make at co-ops is, you know, there's two vehicles often for co-ops to uh, obtain owner investment. One is direct investment, C stock in terms for Minnesota. I'll explain those in a minute. And owner loans or member loans. And that's the historic way that we've financed our co-ops over the years. And so you, sometimes you can make an adjustment that the owner loans is pseudo equity. And so that's what the second set of tiered uh, numbers are. And so let's just kind of break down. So this is another slide. This is the last slide for my presentation. Um, there's a number of different forms of equity on our balance sheet. So when I started at Sewer, we had equity of $447,000 total on our, on our books. Um, but uh, if you look at this, there's a number of different types. A stock in Minnesota is the ownership stock. When someone joins the co-op, they buy voting shares, that's the, for us, $75. And you can see it's a pretty steady, even number across the history of the co-op. But the one that I really want to talk about and is the patronage refund B stock. So 
you know, if you think about, you know, uh, running a, a good operation, which is core, this is an uh, assumption, uh, you know, over the history of the Seward Co-op, we've had 35 to 4% pre-distribution net income, which is what creates the patrons refund. And as we go from 6 million to now 34 million, that 3 to 4% actually becomes quite a bit more m uh, money. Uh, in the last few years, it's been more around like $800,000 is what our patrons refunds have been running. And so then the question is how much of that's distributed in cash, the board has to make that decision, and how much is distributed in equity, in B stock, allocated uh, value to the owner. And part of what I'm wanting to talk about here is really the importance of that B stock piece. And uh, it's been the biggest growth of equity for sewer co-op. And we've actually, since I started at the co-op 20 plus years ago, we've always had this view that B stock should be stay in the co-op. It should never be uh, repurchased, never be redeemed. And the reason why is there's always a need for capital for the co-op. But, the, the, um, but the real question becomes if, you really, if we're really wanting to grow the market more effectively, we have to ask ourselves how are we going to build the capital basis to leverage to the future. You know? And this is actually a really important vehicle. And there's actually some really rational and lo logical reasons why this should be part of our consideration about how we capitalize the future. And the reason why is that if you think about uh, how the patrons refund is, is distributed, it's distributed proportional to use. Whoever uses the co-op more uh, gets a bigger share of the profit. If you think about the wear and tear on the business and the who proportionally had more wear and tear on the business. It would be people who use the store the most. So the Patrick's refund vehicle is actually a very good way to match the use of the co-op's assets with the investment requirement of the co-op. You know, obviously, when you go to look at, at, at building greater capacity, you, there's maybe some counter logic that could be, you know, that could undermine that a little bit, but I actually think there's some real value because what happens is the co-op grows and, and has more and more people demanding use of its space is there is a need to, to move and have additional uh, spaces for them. So the, the, the question becomes, you know, with B-Stock is, you know, isn't that the owner's money? And the answer is yes, absolutely. But it's also the owner's co-op. You know, so shouldn't the owners of the co-op reinvest. And so my, my point is, because I've, I've heard this in the past through peers and conversations, that you know, this is just money on loan temporarily and we have to repurchase it sometime down the road. I think there's a good argument for that this should actually never be repurchased unless the co-op ceases to exist. Because as, for as long as the co-op is going to exist, there's going to be a need for capital. There's going to need to be reinvestment in the co-op. Co and it, it has a very strong basis to have that reinvestment proportional to use. And um, at the end of the day, it is a board decision. And one of the reasons why I really felt like this is a great opportunity to talk about this particular topic is that board members should really think about what is their role in governance. It's to represent the interests of the owners of the co-op, right? And to safeguard and provide a strong fiduciary uh, basis for the co-op to exist for the next generation, to leave something for the future and not just live in the, the now. And so that's my conversation about equity and how to build equity. Obviously, you need to grow your operations to build the equity through Patchen's Refund, and you need to have solid operations and share the profits proportionally to use. But if you do that, there's actually a very good avenue for building a stronger balance sheet.